Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today we're joined with Aif Vanderwort on revolutionizing the way we fit disposable soft contact lenses on the OI show. Thanks for joining us for the Optometric Insight Show. Make sure to like and subscribe and uh, leave comments below. Um, we're excited to have Aif uh, Vanderwart join us again uh, on the Optometric Insight Show. Uh, this time, we're going to be uh, digging a little bit deeper into some of the research that Aif's done. If you listen to the prior episode, which we'll link in the show notes, uh, where we learn a little bit more about AFE. Uh, you'll learn about how he's worked through the eye care industry and worked through the clinical practice and worked through uh, his PhD process. And uh, I've always enjoyed the, the learning from AFE and he's been uh, really instrumental in so much of the, the clinical practice, the way that we do it today. AFE uh, works in conjunction with the group at Pacific University, Matt Lampa, Mark Andre, Pat Caroline, and as many of you know, I'm tied in with that group as well, having done my residency there. Um, there was some work that was recently brought about that I learned from the Pacific Group about fitting our soft contact lens patients in lenses that actually fit them. And uh, I recall back when I was uh, when uh, as a student, AF, that uh, Mark Andre said, "Well, hopefully." Someday, and I, I, this is 2004, 2005, someday we'll have sagittal depths listed on the contact lens package insert. So we, we know that this is. And here we are 15 years later thinking that, whoa, by and behold, soft contact lens sagittal depth makes a big difference. Talk with this about how, how this all came about and how you guys really worked to bring this about in the, in the eye care world today. Yeah, well, very passionate about that one, uh, Dave. But the funny thing is, um, it actually stems from the scleral lens uh, yeah. study. It, we didn't even talk about that in the last episode. Uh, but of course, sclerals is, is very dear to my heart. And uh, yeah. actually, that scleral lens guide, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's uh, that came out 10 years ago. So that has been the decade of, of exploring scleral lens fitting, but it starts, of course, with understanding scleral shape. And um, well, funny enough, by learning more about scleral shape, hence overall ocular shape, we now are applying that to soft lens fitting, actually, in the way we want to approach that. So we have, in essence, the um, knowledge gap on ocular surface shape is 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 narrowing down substantially mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we know so to cut things short um dave the average ocular surface over a given cord which is a diameter of 15 millimeter and why 15 millimeter well typical soft lens is 14 14 2 right and mm -hmm. then if you would allow for 0 0.3 0 0.3 movement on either yeah. side then your workbench is probably 15 millimeters. So that's right. what we want to know, right? Uh, if we want to fit soft lenses. Now, over that cord, we've looked at it with OCT 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and then later with profilometry, the two new instruments that are out there, and then lately with the with Shine Fluke, so the Pentacam. And uh, funny enough, no matter what instrument you use, they all come down to roughly the same number, which is... Mm -hmm. Um, just from a clinical perspective, about 3,750 microns. So that is what your average Joe that works, walks into your practice, well, today probably will look like with a, mm -hmm. with a range of about 900 microns between the flattest and the steepest eye. So that's your, your beautiful, and it is a beautiful bell curve. I don't have my PowerPoint, uh, so it's, it's <laughs> funny talking, <laughs> but it's, uh, it is a bell curve. You got to believe me. So that is one given. The other giving is um, if there are differences between horizontal and vertical. I don't want to make it too technical, but we're, 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 we're understanding much better now what the average eye looks like. So the mm -hmm. only thing we need to know next is what are our tools or soft lenses that we put on the eye. Now, what do we mm -hmm. know about them? 
up to recently, not a whole lot. And that right. is, really, you know, mm -hmm. again, it's one of those things, Dave, we talked about it in the last podcast, um, a clinical question comes up and that's the kind of research right. I like and Pacific like. So uh, we, uh, we joined forces there. And I did a study a couple of years ago with um, an instrument from uh, from Germany, and um, with that instrument, it's 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 a bulky instrument, but it's a beautiful instrument where you could measure the sagittal height or the sagittal depth of uh, of lenses. And uh, we did a few, um, but now there's a new instrument coming from England. Um, it's OCT. Based. So it's an OCT instrument where you put the lens in. It's a small little instrument. It's uh -huh. it's it's no bigger than, than your microphone. And um, you put your lens in and you can measure a sagittal uh, depth of all these lenses. So we did that with 44 commercial lenses out there, daily uh -huh. disposable, two-week, four-week uh, replacement lenses, Torx as well. And, you know, again, I don't want to be too technical, but we measured every lens nine times. Uh, we had three lenses of each, and then we measured each three times, so nine measurements, just to make sure that we had the right sagittal depth. Sure. And, um, well, you know, it's funny. When you put those in graphs, first time we were almost, well, not in shock, but it was kind of shocking to see that it was such a linear relationship between all these lenses. It's almost like the companies at some convention when they sat together and said, well, if you make this, I'll make the next one uh, 50 microns higher and again and again and again. So we have this range of lenses. But, um, well, um there are a couple of limitations, and I'll come to that later, because uh, it's not answering all of our questions for sure. But um, now, if you have a lens on the eye, and let's say it's the middle of your, your graph, and you see that lens is either too steep or too flat, at least you know you got to go right on the graph or left on the graph for a next uh, potential new lens that would fit. Again, there's material properties, there's lens design issues, lens edge profile or design. Yep. So all these things are uh, are factors as well. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's something we, uh, we we can't control for. The one thing that we can control as eye care practitioners, you and I, is the lens fit. I, I have no control over tear film and I have no control over all the variables and material, again, is limited what I can do in, in terms of choice because the lenses are made in a given uh, material. But um, so if I'm lucky, I have two base curves, right? And then right. I can look at the graph and what are the sagittal heights. And mm -hmm. typically in our day and age, um, the old guys, uh, Pat Caroline and, um, and Mark Andre, they always talk about different diameters that they would order. Well, right. that was, that was then. And we don't have that anymore. We kind of lost that to be honest. So we're mm -hmm. not, I don't know. I don't want to, well, let, let me play advocate of the devil a little bit. Uh, we're not fitting soft lenses anymore, right? We're just mm -hmm. throwing something on and then hope and pray for the best. And the worst part, Dave, is that if it doesn't work, we don't know where to go next. We have no idea, basically, uh, to go, well, with right. the graph, at least you have a first indication where to go next. And yeah. uh, a good friend of ours, John Gallus, you know him pretty well as well, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, he works in uh, in New York, and he has this practice with a lot of chronoconus eyes, so very steep eyes, and a lot of post-refractive surgery, which are typically the more mm -hmm. flatter eyes. And he has all the lenses that are available lined up in his practice based on sagittal height. So basically yeah. following our chart. So if he has a flat eye, he literally walks left in his fitting room uh -huh. to go to one of those lenses there, or he goes to the right. So that is roughly the idea behind yeah. the sagittal charts so. maybe we'll we'll do that in the future so i i uh i, I love this graph and uh what we're going to do is we'll we'll post um a link to the uh to the journal article um and uh you know as of the time of we're recording this i believe you can still download it for free we'll see if that remains in the future but we'll we'll put a link in there yes or and or um at the Pacific, we have a dedicated 
specific website now sure. where all the information is. Right. And um, that is, we're going to update that as we go along. So we're, we're having new lenses that are analyzed right now. As soon as that becomes available, it will be. So the best resource yeah. after the article um, is uh, the Pacific website. Actually. Sure. We'll put a link to that, Eighth. Uh, that'll be really, really helpful. Um, I know that, uh, you know, already as, uh, as my new residents have come in, there's been a couple lenses that have been released onto the market even in the last year or so. And, and they, they, they start complaining about the graph that it doesn't include the new, newest lens. Well, where does this one fit in? And I'm like, well, hey, you know, it took them a long time to do these 44 lenses. Uh, I, I quick did a calculation. That's almost 1,200 measurements that you did of, uh, of 27 different lenses when you had to do uh, 44 different lenses 27 different times of, of, of doing it. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, so all kudos I, to uh, Ben Caldrick of uh, of um, uh, Contamac, who uh, uh, Optimac, I'm sorry, to uh, who did that. Uh, yeah, all, all these measurements. I'll put that through. Um, but that's that's a nice compliment, actually. But we're we're working on it. So we have yeah. the new some new lenses, some uh, some lenses for myopia control that are in the pipeline, and uh, uh -huh. that we'll have up uh, as soon enough. So just to kind of give everybody a, a little bit of, a, a, of an, uh, another way to describe this, we've, uh, we've been using this in our practice for, you know, a little over a year, maybe a year and a half. And uh, what, what this is, is let's imagine a patient is just the average Joe, as, uh, as Afe pointed out, with a, maybe a sagittal depth of 3750. Well, if you're like me in clinical practice, I don't measure that on every single patient, but let's just assume that he's right in the bell-shaped curve. Now, there's a list of lenses that have around about that sagittal depth that is on this graph that, that AFE described. Now, there may be a patient in my practice who I look at their cornea and I say, hey, this is a gigantic cornea. This cornea is, uh, is, is different than the average person, and I just, from my slit lamp or uh, a photograph that I've taken can just tell that this person has a very, very large cornea, or maybe their K's are a 46, 47, and there's no pathology. Well, in that case, I may be driven to the right, so to speak, in this particular case, or vice versa, uh, with a lower sagittal depth, which usually is a smaller cornea or a flatter K. Not always, but usually the sagittal depth could be related to that. Is that you know somewhat what you're thinking, AFE, as well? Yeah, exactly. Especially the combination, of course, of, of a smaller cornea with a uh, with a flat K, then you know that I has a very low sagittal uh, sagittal height or depth. Um, and there is, of course, a point, Dave, where you cannot fit your eyes with the standard lenses that we have anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, the difference, for instance, between if a lens has two base curves, right? So some of the lenses have two base curves. Sure. The difference between lens A and B uh, is typically 275 microns. So that's mm -hmm. not a whole lot. So that's your your the tools that you have. But remember, the eyes from flat to steep in the normal population, we're not talking cones and everything, is about 900 microns. So mm -hmm. you can, it's it's easy to tell that on the left, far left and far right of the spectrum, there is an area where you cannot go with your standard soft lenses yeah. anymore. And that is yeah. also what we're trying to say. That's what I said, uh, SAGS is not going to solve all of our problems. It's a starting point. So I think best thing is to do is actually see if you can measure the ocular surface and find normal eyes. Mm -hmm. So I always you know, use this anagram in my, my lecture with a beautiful Disney picture, Finding Nemo's. It's about mm -hmm. finding normal eyes measured ocular surfaces. If if your eye falls in the normal range, whether you do it by, by central case, corneal diameter, or the combination of those, that's probably mm -hmm. better. Um, and if you can throw in eccentricity, that would help too. Um, or you take a topographer like a Metmont that measures the corneal data, but if you measure the angle out on the cornea and assumes that that angle transitions into the sclera, mm -hmm, which often right. does, you can predict the overall sagittal height over 50 millimeters. Or if you happen to be a scleral lens fitter and have one of those 
profilometers or OCTs or whatever, then you can actually measure the ocular surface. But yeah. one of these three methods, find your NEMOs. And then if you have one of these, then you can use the charts and see if you can play mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. But also, so I think we, we should be careful not to fit everybody with a custom lens. It doesn't make sense. The commercial right. lenses Agreed. that we have are the best we ever had. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're up Good to material. Yep. material. They're thin, uh, can dispose daily if we mm -hmm. want. Um, so it's not going to get much better than that for right. a patient. Right. But the other way around too, Dave, if we have an out of standard eye, yeah. you can replace lenses two times, three times, four times, but you're most probably not going to find a lens that fits that eye. And then you actually custom made lenses come in and uh, could make a huge difference. Uh, yeah. So your dropout rate also, I think, could be reduced. There's this mm -hmm. one little uh, calculation by Phil Morgan I think he uh, wrote about it in Spectrum and says, if you could reduce your dropout rate, which is what, 25% now, if you could reduce that by three or 4% on a yearly basis, right? then between now and 2040, which is not that far away, you could double the amount of patients in your practice. It's almost unbelievable, but I, I uh -huh. recalculated and came to the same conclusion. Uh -huh. Now our goal is, or my goal is, and the Pacific team is to say, well, listen, you know, dropouts is hugely complex. You got all these material issues and, and tear film, but lens fit is one of them. And if you mm -hmm. could reduce the dropout rate by just a couple of percentages, just based on lens fit, and I think we should be able to do that, then again, look at what we could yeah. do for our contact lens industry. Well, I can speak to, as a clinician, using that information, uh, we were given the graphs, uh, you know, as you guys were developing them with the Pacific team, and they were kind of sharing them with me. And, you know, in clinical practice, we had, uh, you know, a patient who was referred to the clinic because they were ready to drop out of their lenses and they had tried every lens that was out there, right? They had, they had tried them all. Well, I said, well, tell me what you've tried. And here the particular patient had a really shallow sagittal depth and they listed the lenses that were, you know, large sagittal depths, uh, some of the really, really good ones my day and daily's total ones. These are le lenses that are listed on the large sagittal depth side. And they had listed some of my favorite lenses all the way down. And, you know, here they were ready to drop out and they were sent to us for us to make them a specialty lens. So we looked at the graph and we look at where they were at and we would try to lens on the far left-hand side, thinking that if, if that lens didn't work, at least we would know and we could go and create a specialty lens for them. But at least let's try a lens that matches better up with their sagittal depth. And I think that's how I see many of us using this. We've printed these graphs that uh, are from this and they'll be available on the website, uh, right? And we've put it right in our contact lens trial room. And so we go into the trial room because we haven't organized them by sagittal depth <laughs> like John has. Um, and we look, well, what is the patient worn? Are they struggling and are they not struggling? This really broke out to me a, a while ago in that I was fitting so many of my patients into brand XYZ lens, which was on a far extreme. And this lens was a new material. It was super comfortable. Everybody was ranting and raving about how great this material was. And uh, we fit all these people into it successfully. And I think because the material was so good, they did well, even if it wasn't a good fitting lens. Well, fast forward a year later, another lens has come out, which I still would consider a good lens, but it wasn't the fancy pantsy material. And I said, hey, some of my patients might want to try this. And they did. And it was really surprised me. Well, lo and behold, the sagittal depth was very different on these two lenses. And I think that it really comes down to, as practitioners, we tend to align with one lens or two or three different lenses as our favorite lenses. And I think in the future, because of your work, what we'll probably do is have our favorite lens that's in the middle and maybe some lenses that are on the, the outskirts that we go to, to sort of solve problems. Uh, whereas right now I might just pick one lens and another lens because 
they both are good materials and not really realize about the fitting. I, I'm sure that has come up many times in your thought process with regards to this. Yeah, it's really cool to hear uh, firsthand. Uh, does it that it actually works in, uh, in practice? <laughs> it <laughs> Dave, does. So it does. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So yeah, again, I want. I do want to emphasize that it's not the answer to all of our questions. No. It's not going to solve all of our problems, but it's no. it's a starting point. And again, the commercial lens that we have are the best we ever had in history yeah. in terms of what you said, material, replacing them. I think uh, Eric Pappas did a study uh, replacing lenses twice daily to see if that added any right. comfort, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. It added only germs because you have to put your <laughs> lens in again. Um, so I think we're, we're up to the, the most comfortable lenses we ever had. And still we have 25% dropouts. I mean, yeah. that, there's got to be a little bit more. And again, mm -hmm. we're just focusing on one aspect. We're not saying that that um, is, is going to uh, get all of our lens wearers in line. But uh, it, it's a starting point. And also, Dave, it's about us. I mean, I don't know about you, but most ICA practitioners uh, charge a fitting fee. And I'm I'm, I'm asking myself, that's what I do here. I sit here all day and think about those <laughs> things, Dave. That's my job. And I think, so what do you base your fitting fee on if you're not actually fitting those lenses? Yeah. And it's, again, it's playing advocate of the devil a little bit because, of course, you know, there's the contact lens management part and the ocular health. Yeah. And as optometrists, we should guard that. But mm -hmm. in terms of really fitting, if you call it a fitting fee, sure. What are you doing? We, we have no idea what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope we can get that. And if we all agree that a contact lens is a commodity, let's do it. Let, let's forget about the whole fitting thing and let's open it up. And people can just order online whatever they want and see right. if it works. Because nope. we're not doing much different than ordering right. something online nope. and see if it works, right? The only sure. thing is we have a slit limb to see if it does or yep. doesn't. Um, or... Basically, we can see if it's a fit problem because otherwise it could be a material problem or whatever, but you can't really see that. So yeah, that's that's really uh, our goal a little bit. And it stems from our good history here in the Netherlands and also at Pacific actually about, you know, the background is rigid lenses and actually fitting lenses and you know exactly what you're doing with okay, okay you exactly know what you're doing. Topography has added to that based on topography, you know, even better what you're doing and what you're mm -hmm. changing to the eye. And one thing, and even sclerals are more of a science in terms of fitting than soft lenses. So I think that's next on my list, at least to look at and see if we can improve it and uh, see if we can get some grip on the fitting part of soft lens fitting again. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Thank you so much for helping uh, helping us clinically know what we're doing. I mean, we're doing it, but we don't know what we're doing. There's a lot of guesswork in this fitting process that we're doing, but you're letting us know that we have the tools uh, at our disposal. You're letting us know that we have the sizes and the measurements to uh, accurately fit this. And I think about, you know, sometimes what we do as uh, as as practitioners is kind of like you know, taking your kid to the shoe store and uh, they've got all the shoe sizes and all those, everything's right there. And you're just trying shoes on, not knowing the size of your kid's foot. Whereas if you go and you measure the size of the kid's foot, you can streamline that process. And I don't mean to oversimplify what we do, but if we can actually do some measurements and know more about the eye than what we right know right now with base curve and diameter and you know, I think one of the other things that we didn't mention in our discussion is that you measured some lenses from some manufacturers compared to other manufacturers where the base curves were very similar to each other, but the sagittal depth was one or 200 microns difference. So as a practitioner, we might say an 8.7 is an 8.7, regardless of what lens we're doing, and they should fit about the same, and they don't. Uh, and so it's by exactly. having these measurements really can help, you know, was that a surprise to you guys when you were looking at that data? 
Not really. It was a confirmation of what we thought, but it's even worse than that or worse, but it, there could be two or 300 microns difference, uh, top of my head, uh, Dave, between one eight six and the next eight six. Mm -hmm. uh, so also for ICA practitioners, but certainly for patients, you know, they may be tempted and some online platforms actually do that to say, well, you got this eight six now. Why did you go to that 8.6? And of course, diameter plays a big role in that. Yeah. If you go bigger with the same base curve, then your sag height goes up. But even with similar diameters, different 8.6s could have substantial differences in sag height. So, yeah. yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that shoe thing. Um, and we didn't rehearse this or anything, but a student of mine um, not too long ago said, when I tried to explain this, he said, ah, I get it. Because we were talking about central case and how it does not translate to the right. overall height and to the central height of the lenses. And he said, so what I do is I try to measure the size of the toe to predict <laughs> how big the foot is. And that is what you're doing with, so you, you said measuring nothing, but yeah. now usually we do central case. Sure. Believe me, Dave, there's no correlation between central case and the overall sagittal height. So it's right. indeed measuring a toe to predict how big, what, what the shoe size is. It's, yeah. uh, it's a first step, but it's well, definitely cool. no more than that. <laughs> hey, well, thanks, buddy. I sure appreciate uh, you joining us for the Optometric Insights Show and sharing your experience, sharing your knowledge, sharing your research, and uh, really helping clinicians be better. And at Optometric Insights, we're about accelerating success. And tools like your research really helps get to the end point successfully far faster. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, have, a, have a fantastic day in the Netherlands. Looks like, uh, looks like you have more sunshine there than I do. We're seeing each other over video. You, you guys aren't all seeing us, but uh, it looks like wow. it's a beautiful day there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dave, and, and thank you for your tools, for this platform. And, and it's all about helping each other and talking about this and uh, see if we can do better together. I think we have a common goal, for instance, in, in, in reducing dropouts, and we should all work together, the big companies, the smaller companies. I don't see them as you know them and, and, and us. It's, uh, we could grow this, uh, this contact lens uh, industry even, even better by, Absolutely. By, by looking at all that. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this episode of the Optometric Insight Show. Make sure to like and subscribe and uh, join us for future episodes. Please note down in the show notes that uh, we've got uh, information about the, uh, the, the guide with regards to the sagittal depths, uh, uh, links to Pacific's website where they're going to be keeping things up to date as new lenses come available. But also, uh, Afe had mentioned, and I didn't reference this, but the scleral lens guide, and that's been an incredible tool over the years. And so we'll link that in the show notes below. And uh, again, thank you for joining us for this episode and stay tuned for more episodes uh, on ways that we can help acceler accelerate your success on the Optometric Insight Show.